Hello, everybody. This is Vince Russo, and I am here with a uh, familiar face, uh, somebody that um, you know I've I've had one conversation with. I hope to get to meet one day because I think this man is absolutely phenomenal. This is Mike Williams. Mike Williams has a podcast and a website, Sage of Quay, um, which also goes hand in hand with a channel, a Paul is Dead channel, talking about the death of Paul McCartney going back to 1966, the replacement of Billy Shears. We're going to get into a lot of that. Mike, how you doing, my friend? Doing well, Vince. Thank you for having me on the show. It's uh, It's been a while since we spoke because it took me a while to get this last presentation done. Yeah, Mike, I, I was keeping track. I was going to the website. I was watching all the podcasts and you kept moving the date back. Yeah. And like, because... I have a good feel for you. I was, I, I kept saying to myself, man, th this is going to be incredible. And uh, he's going to do it. There was never a question in my mind, but I also knew you were going to leave no stone unturned. No, I was going to do it. I, I made a commitment and I keep to my commitments. It's just that um, for anybody who watches the presentation, they can now see that the amount of information that I had to plow through and vet and connect the dots on was enormous. And um, so it took a long time to go through that, especially when you have other stuff to do in life, you know, like you have a job and a family and everything else. So, um, but the last, I would say the last four to five weeks, I was pretty much heads down. So any free time I had, I was just focused on getting it out because I didn't want to delay it anymore. Yeah. Mike, I have to ask you this before we start, and it's going to be a little off topic, but I have to ask you this, and I'm going to ask you to try to answer it in a couple of paragraphs, which I know is impossible, but a lot of people knew I was going to interview you, and they wanted to get your thoughts on the coronavirus. And I've been reading um, some of your coverage, listening to some of the things that you are saying can you please give us your thoughts on what's currently going on? Okay, so I'll give you my my position or my opinion on this thing. People are obviously not going to agree. It's not real in the sense that it's not some killer virus. What they've done is they've taken the normal flu season, a viral strain, and they've given it a name. And this has allowed them to play out the whole pandemic um, scenario that we're seeing today. And one of the things that I did was to take a look at the numbers. So everything that the controlling apparatus does, everything is done by the numbers. So when this first came out, they first came out with coronavirus, and then that became COVID-19. So my first thought was, well, why did they change the nomenclature? Why did they change the name of the virus from coronavirus to COVID-19? So it turns out that coronavirus in numerology uh, equals the number 11, and COVID-19 in numerology is 9. So it's 9-11. 9-11, that number, September 11th, the date, and so on, is a very, very important number in the occult. And it represents moments in time when they can transform. It's when they can make drastic changes. Uh, if anybody remembers uh, Rahm Emanuel saying that you never let a good crisis go to waste, mm -hmm. this is what's happening. And it's also an indication for anybody who's really paying attention and wants to connect the dots that the whole concept of a worldwide government exists. Right? So... They want everybody to believe that we have our own sovereign countries and is this nationalism and so on. That doesn't exist because this is all being controlled at an international level. And we can see this just by the sheer fact that everything has a template. So what's happening here is happening in Europe. It's happening in Australia. It's happening um, in South America. It's happening everywhere. It's the same template, it's the same words, it's the same edicts, controls, and so on that are in place. So why are they doing it? And I've been asked this question, and again, this is my opinion. Uh, 
what the what the controllers do periodically is to run exercises. In fact, uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, right? I uh, hope I pronounced his name correctly. He came out a couple of weeks ago during a, um, or Mike Pompeo, right? A couple of weeks ago, and he said during a press conference, he called it an exercise. Very interesting words, right? He called it an exercise. I called it a drill going back a few weeks ago, which is the same thing as an exercise. And so what they're doing is they're testing how effective their, their uh, network is in responding to tops down orders. So in other words, for, you have to first get your head wrapped around the fact that there is a shadow government. There is a deep state that this does exist. Okay. The president of the United States, the prime minister of, of, uh, of England and the prime ministers and the presidents across the world, they are not where the buck stops. They have masters, they have bosses. And so they're testing to see how responsive their, net, their network is. And this includes their first responders, you know, police, firemen, EMS, medical, media, obviously they have in their back pocket. This is why we're getting inundated 24 seven with coronavirus, COVID-19. And um, they want to they want to test to see how quickly the governors will use the United States because Vince and I live in the States, how quickly they can implement the plans that they need them to implement. How quickly can they rein everything in? How quickly can they get people to obey and be compliant and just follow the rules that have been laid out for them? And uh, so that's what I believe this is. There is no killer virus out there. The CDC's own numbers on any given year in the United States, 56,000 people die from flu-related illnesses on any given year. And in the United States, the coronavirus slash COVID-19 is nowhere near those numbers. In fact, I was reading this morning that the stock market surged another 1,100 points because they are seeing that the virus is uh, letting up in New York. Now, the thing is, you know, I, uh, my lady and I, just a few days ago, we were hearing all these stories about hospitals, the me mainstream media telling us that, you know, they're beyond capacity, they need ventilators, there's people coming in that are sick and so on. And then we, we have the alternative media saying the hospitals are quiet. There's no unusual activity. So about two weeks ago, uh, one of my family members, Vince and I spoke before we got on the show here, is ill. And he's he's very ill. And um, so he had to be rushed to the hospital two weeks ago to a major hospital in the Raleigh area. And I'm talking about a very large hospital. So the EMS took him to the emergency room. We met him there, uh, well, the EMS there, to bring him into the ER. And when I got there, Vince, it's an enormous waiting room in his ER, in his hospital in Raleigh. There was only three other people sitting in the emergency room aside from my family. There was five of us. So eight people total, us five and the three other people. This was in the midst of the coronavirus frenzy. So I, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, well, this doesn't look like a frenzy to me. This doesn't look like a bunch of people coming in that are really ill, coughing, hacking, sneezing, and so on. Nothing. So he was admitted. And the next day, you know, I came back. And uh, so I went to the main entrance this time, the lobby, to check in and sign in. And again, there was very little activity. And then when I went to go park the car in this particular hospital, parking sometimes, many times, can be a challenge because I've been there before. And the parking lot was wide open. So I said, this, this something's not right with this. So uh, going back about three days ago, my lady and I went uh, on a ride. We got in our car and I said, let's take a look at some of the urgent cares in our neighborhood, the primary care that I go to in my neighborhood. And let's check out three hospitals, local hospitals. And we did. So when I got to the two urgent cares, there was nobody in them. The first one had nobody. The second one had two people sitting in the waiting area. And this, this particular urgent care is a combination primary care 
and urgent care. So they share the same waiting area. Between the two, there was two people. That's it. And so then we went to the um, to the hospitals. And we went to a hospital in uh, a town just outside of mine, a smaller hospital. It was crickets. Parking lot was empty. Then we went to two larger hospitals, one in Cary, North Carolina, and the other one in Raleigh, North Carolina. And again, very quiet, nothing. They had the tents at the two larger hospitals, and uh, but there was absolutely no activity. There was, at the larger hospital, excuse me, at the second largest hospital, the one in Cary, the tents were up. There was like uh, two or three of them. And there were three healthcare workers at a small table up close toward the building. One of them was, was standing up doing something and two others were at the table playing with their phones. No activity, none whatsoever. So to add on to this, yesterday I, I, went, I went to the urgent care myself. It wasn't anything uh, bad. I, I've been, I have some asthma. Okay. And so I went to the, to the uh, urgent care, just something had piqued my interest. You know, you're always on alert when you have asthmatic symptoms. So I just drove myself over there and I got to talk to the nurse while I was waiting for the doctor to come in. And so I, and again, I go in there, it's a Sunday, it's like uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, nobody in the, in the waiting room, nobody. I was the only one there. So I go back and so I'm talking to this to the nurse, and I said, "So, you, are you seeing a lot of coronavirus?" And he goes, "Oh yeah." I said, "You are." He says, "Yeah." I said, "Well, how are you determining it?" He says, "Well, we don't have test kits, so if somebody comes in and they say they have a cold or they have the symptoms like a fever and stuff like that, you know, flu symptoms, mm -hmm. they're labeling it coronavirus." And this nurse told me they don't have any test kits. They have just been instructed that when somebody comes in with cold or flu symptoms, it's coronavirus. Gosh. All right. So, so what's happening is if somebody comes in and they have the cold or they have the flu, and that's how it's being labeled, they're obviously padding the numbers. So then I said, well, if somebody has coronavirus and you've diagnosed it, what do you do then? And um, they said to me, we send them home. I said, that's it? He goes, yeah, we send them home. We tell them to self-quarantine and just, you know, and get better. I said, well, that's the same thing you would do with the flu or, or the cold. You would go home and you would, you know, take the cold medication or the flu medication. Or some people don't take any of that stuff. They have home remedies and they just wait it out. And in mm -hmm. a week, you're up and you're on your feet again. And then I said to him, you know, I heard that there are these tents. And I was playing a little dumb because I didn't want him. <laughs> he didn't know who I was, you know, and I was being very nice to him because he was a really good guy. And, right. uh, you know, and uh, he was just offering this information to me, you know. And I said, well, what about the tents? I said, how does that work? He goes, I have no idea. He says, uh, when you get to go to these tents, he says, there is a, a vetting process. There's a questionnaire you have to fill out. I said, you have to fill out a questionnaire before you can get tested at these tents? He goes, yeah. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense. It seems to me that these tents are set up to be the first line of defense, triage. And that's, when we went to the one hospital, that's how the tent was labeled. It had a big sign on it. It said triage. And then you have to go fill out this form. And he said, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. He goes, I, I just hope this doesn't last in very long. And I said, well, what are you being told inside of your uh, your own medical facility, which is very large, by the way? It's a very large uh, medical network within uh, North Carolina. And so what I was asking was, are you getting any direction tops down about where this is going? How long do you think you're going to have to be on alert and doing all this stuff? And he says, we're getting no information whatsoever. He goes, other than what's on TV. So I said, you're not getting any information from within your own internal organization. You have to rely on the television set. He goes, yeah. He says, I'm telling you, Mr. Williams, there's a lot of people, he said, that are very, very scared. I said, of course, they're very, very scared. I said, because the stuff is running 
on the television 24 seven, seven days a week, everything is coronavirus and COVID-19. In fact, when we went to the emergency room two weeks ago, Vince, we get in there, they had the TV sets, you know, all of them in the ER are putting this fearful stuff, pumping it into the emergency room while people are sitting there because they have loved ones that had to be rushed to the hospital. It's just, it was an environment that was so surreal and beyond any level of decency, in my opinion. My family, actually my sister got up and went to the person at the desk and said, could you do us a favor and change that channel and put something on that it's not all this fear porn. He goes, well, some people, we don't want to hear this. He goes, we don't, you know? Yeah. And so they did, they changed the channel. But, you know, this is this is very, very strange. And um, and so, you know, why the exercise and why the drill? I mentioned in one video I had on my main channel, I don't have a crystal ball. But anytime they do stuff like this, it's in preparation for something else in the future, right? So, so, so they need to test the system to make sure that when they have to deploy the system, that it's wor it'll work properly. It'll respond correctly. And th one of the things that they've done is they don't want to put troops in the street. They don't want to have police in the street. They don't want to do that stuff. They don't want the papers, please perception, right? Mm -hmm. So what they've done is they, they've indoctrinated people to browbeat each other into compliance. So if, if you happen to be outside, you want to walk your dog, your neighbors are kind of looking at you with the evil eye and you, know, you shouldn't be out. You shouldn't be doing this. You should be inside. You're going to kill people. You're going to affect you know, the health of others. So this is a, this is a tactic that that the deep state uses all the time, which is is they actually use the population itself to to actually force compliance, peer pressure, as an example. You know. It's just unbelievable. I mean, we were walking on a trail. Our trail here where we live, is it's a big lake. It's nice. It's very pretty. And uh, most people are just, you know, a level-headed and they're just going for a walk with their their spouse or their partner or their kids. And uh, But you do have the – I had one guy the other day. Uh, my lady and I were walking and uh, we were talking. This guy's coming toward us. This guy actually veered off and walked into the woods around us. And, and, you know, we, we, we let him go. We just, we started, I started chuckling. And, and so she said to Barry said to me, she says, so <laughs> you caught that mic? I'm like, How could I not? He's in there with the squirrels now, you know? So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's just unbelievable, Vince. And, you know, so, and when you question it, you know, and, you know, it's legitimate to question things. But they've gotten people to the point where even if you question it, even if you ask reasonable questions, you are deemed a, a nut job, a conspiracy yeah. theorist. You know, you shouldn't be questioning. Just follow direction. Listen to the authorities. Now in North Carolina, and I was told this is already in place in other uh, states in the United States. Basically, you're going to have to go take a number to go shopping because they only want so many people in the store per square foot. Yeah, they just did that in a Walmart here today. Just did it. Five people every 1,000 square feet. Yeah, with signs all over the place. Social distancing, social distancing. This is, this, is, this is conditioning, folks. It's conditioning. It's to get you thinking in terms of separating yourself from, you know, from your neighbor, from your family. It, it's just, it, just an unbelievable psychological operation. And what's really disheartening to me is how many people just, just cool. fold their cards fall in line and don't question anything. Yeah. You know, it's it's very disheartening because I'm telling you, they're taking away our rights and uh and people are just allowing it to happen. You know, Mike, when we when we get into, you know, talking about, you know, McCartney and and Rubber Soul and all that, you know, you know, I learned through you and I I learned, you know, through reading, you know, you Harriet. I did not know this before, but you know, when you talk about Illuminati, yeah, they put it out there right in front of your face because that that that's part of it. That's part of the system because nobody's going to believe it. Right. And the thing that blew me away that you know a couple of my friends that a conspiracy theor theorist, uh, you know, put me on to was that um, that a conference that two hundred one conference. 
Yeah. That took place October 31st. You can go online and you can see highlights from this conference, which was a um which, which was a preparation. Right. The end of October for exactly what is happening now. Right. How can nobody be talking about that? Because people do not pay attention to alternative uh, news, uh, you know, a very small percentage of people do. So many people, Vince, are glued to the uh, to the uh, to the television set and the cable news and the network news. Basically, um, it's the Ministry of Propaganda, and people just soak it up and they believe what they're getting is the truth. You're not getting the truth. You're not getting the truth. You're you're getting fed an agenda. And they're indoctrinating you and conditioning you to uh, to follow whatever it is that they're putting out there and to be obedient and compliant. Uh, that's people the do one thing. That's the one thing, Mike. I think more than anything else, I'm concerned about. And the one thing I'm concerned about is going forward. Are they going to take out this card every single time they want to control the public? Yeah, I mean, I think what. This has shown, if it is a drill and an exercise, um, is uh, it has shown that their ability to have the vast majority of people to fall in line and walk single file, it's 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 done. It's cooked. You know, the people that question it, they're the outliers, right? So they're few and far between. So I, I do believe that they run these these tests every once in a while. They, they, they float these things out there because they do want to see how indoctrinated and conditioned people are. Because to the degree that they think that they have an overwhelming critical mass of people that will just follow, you know, they can walk off a cliff. These people will walk off the cliff with them. Mm -hmm. um, that allows them to now take the next step and whatever that transformation is to change the society and change the culture, that's what they're doing. And, um, you know, but unfortunately, as we've discussed, most people, they are completely unaware of this. If you talk to people about the deep state, if you talk to them about shadow government, if you talk to them about the pyramid of power, the Illuminati, they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And if they do have some semblance of an idea the first thing they think is you're a nut job. You're a conspiracy theorist. You have a tinfoil hat and this stuff doesn't really exist yet. As you know, I've shown with the last presentation on the Beatles music, it's all hidden in plain sight. If you look, it is there. They are telling you, but you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. If you don't, then you're just going to be in the matrix. You know, it's like the movie, the matrix. You want the red pill or the blue pill. Red pill is reality. Blue pill is the imaginary, illusionary world. Most people are taking the blue pill. Yeah. Let me ask you this one last question. As far as the situation right now, what what would your guess be on the end game? What 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 do you think the end game is with what we're uh, experiencing right now? That's that's a good question. Uh, one of the things is that. Um, they really do want to damage the economy to the degree where they're going to uh, bring forth the one world currency. This is mm -hmm. something that they have been planning for a very long time. Yeah. But because people are so uh, attached to the whole uh, nationalistic viewpoint, like, you know, the U.S. dollar and so on, that people would be re reluctant to, you know, to give that up. But I think what they're going to say is that, see, now we had a worldwide event where all of the countries had to come together. It's something that affected everybody. It just didn't affect the people in the United States or the people in the UK. It was everybody. So we have to have, uh, we have to have more commonality. We have to have, we have to tie it together. So I think that what they're going to say is one of those starts is going to be a one world currency. And that one world currency is clearly going to be uh, digital. Uh, they don't want real money out there. They don't want to. They don't want a black market. They want to be able to account for everything because you know they they do want to tax everything. That's the whole thing. You know, taxation is is slavery. 
You're a debt slave because you're the one that's going to work. You're the one earning the money, not them. And then they steal 30 to 40 percent over every dollar that people make under the guise that we need to do this because if we don't, we can't build roads. We can't do this. It's all nonsense. Because if the government were all, not allowed, but if the government actually in the United States actually adhered to the Constitution, the Treasury would coin its own money and there would be no debt. Because if you create your own money, you can't have debt. You created it. You mm -hmm. can't owe yourself money. Right. Right. So if the Treasury prints its own money, on behalf of the U.S. government, and instead of saying Federal Reserve notes on top of the pieces of paper that you carry around your pocket, and it said U.S. government notes, it would be a whole different story. The other thing that I think that they want to push is the whole vaccine um, uh, program. They really want to step that up. Uh, the anti-vaccination um, segment of society has gotten a lot of traction because they've been asking a lot of questions, legitimate questions, in my view. And uh, and they don't want even legitimate questions asked about vaccines, even though there are whistleblowers that have stepped forward and s have said that these pharmaceutical companies are well aware that the vaccines are tied to other illnesses. All right. So, but they don't want to have that discussion. And uh, so, what's going to happen now is that's going to be this gigantic, you know, it's going to start off as a snowball at the top of the mountain. And now it's going to be a, a, a landslide by the time it hits the base of the mountain. And they're looking just to plow over anybody that's going to ask questions about vaccinations. Yeah. Wow. You know, so those are two things off the top of my mind, you know, that I think that are, uh, could be the results of all this. Um, you know, they, you know, the censorship that took place on, on, Social media, it's still in place. You know, I've, I personally have had shows yanked. Uh, mm -hmm. They went back on me four or five years. Shows were up for four or five years on YouTube talking about various topics. And my, and when, you know, when I have my shows, I'm not combative or mm -hmm. some kind of lunatic shouting into a microphone. My guests are very intelligent people who are well researched on their topics, and we're having a very adult conversation, a very intellectual conversation about something. But they don't want that. They don't want voices of reason. They don't want intelligent conversation because that might start to get people to wake up a little bit and pay attention. So what do they do? They shoot those shows and they take them out. Yeah. You know, and then we say, okay, we'll put it on bit shoot. That's great. I have my bit shoot uh, channel, but let's face it. YouTube is the king of video for social media. Yeah. The other ones pale in comparison. So they're trying to pigeonhole us and paint us into a corner. And so we have to figure out other ways to be able to get the word out. Yeah. All right, Mike. Let's. Uh, we got to turn our attention to yeah. uh, to your swan to your uh, swan song, which I'm going to fight every step of the way. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I swear, Mike. Got off your presentation four and a half hours. I watched it over four days because I wanted to take everything in. I, I took notes. Um, so, um, you know, Saturday, obviously we all have to find things to do at this current time. So I have all the Beatles films on DVD. So the first thing I said is I'm going to watch help. Uh, help has always been one of my favorite Beatle movies. I think that's my favorite movie because of the music and it's you know, help, help and rub a soul are my two favorite Beatle albums, you know? Yeah. So now I'm, I'm, I'm listening to your report and I'm hearing about, you know, really during the, the filming of Help, there was a lot of marijuana involved, a lot of the usage of drugs for the first time with the Beatles. So I was like, let me let me watch Help. Let me see how these guys appear. Let me let me see if they you know appear under the influence. OK, so so I sat there. I watched Help. Mike, then I had sitting on my shelf. I have never watched this before. I had the magical mystery tour. And I said, I am finally going to put on the magical mystery tour. Mike, I put on the ma magical mystery tour. And all I'm thinking about is Mike Williams is not going anywhere. Because <laughs> Mike, I... you could probably spend five years picking that movie alone apart 
because I sat there and I watched Magical Mystery Tour. Not a lot is said about that film. Yeah. But when that film is complete, I'm sitting there knowing, man, there was a lot of shit in that movie that I did not get. And I've not heard you talk about that film much. Can you give me your little insights? Because, man, I watched that from start to finish, and I don't know what I experienced. Yeah, well, Magical Mystery Tour is uh, is all occulted. Um, it has uh, the 9-11 encoded in it uh, with, within the movie. I believe it was either started, uh, filming began on 9-11, I think so, for Magical Mystery Tour. And um, that was the brainchild of Billy. So Billy was the one that put it together. And, you know, and Billy is an occultist, uh, plain and simple. Uh, he's heavily into the occult, uh, into, um, into magic and so on. And um, so Magical Mystery Tour is filled with all kinds of, all kinds of symbolism. Um, even um, I Am the Eggman is really uh, a play on Humpty Dumpty, fell off the wall, Right, and they couldn't put him back together again. Right, that's a, a Paul is dead clue. Uh, it's um, I wish I I wish I had my cheat sheet in front of me right now, but I, I would be able to take you through more of the uh, the occult that's embedded in Magical Mystery Tour. But re rest assured that it's it's completely occulted um, the whole thing. And it when it came out, uh, it got trashed because. The average person, you know, really didn't understand what it was all about because it is this kind of this crazy mixed bag of stuff, right? Uh, but what Billy did with that movie was that it, it was really uh, filled with occultism, and for people who understand the occult, they would they would get very clearly what it is that the the film was was depicting. And for those that don't understand the way this works with the in the occult and magic is if you focus on it and you watch it and pay attention to it uh, in, in, a, in the occult, your focus, your consciousness focused on something gives it power, right? Your thoughts focused gives, gives their magic power. Mm -hmm. And they believe that that enables them to be able to, to manifest whatever it is their objectives or their goals are. And so it, it goes both ways. If you if you understand the occult, you know exactly what they're doing and saying, and you know, and, and why. If you don't, it doesn't matter anyway because they're basically usurping your energy, your conscious energy, and your thoughts, and manipulating it, and so that they can manifest what it is that they want. Yeah, Mike, I learned something else, man. I was doing a little research when I wanted to come out. It, it, it makes me laugh because when I used to work for Vince McMahon. Mike, my whole thing was I got down to the point where, you know, I was going to write the perfect wrestling television show and he wasn't going to be able to poke one hole in it. So now as I'm doing this research, I, I'm getting excited because I'm saying to myself, on one hand, I'm saying to myself, I'm going to find something that Mike has not found. But then I know I'm going to hit Mike with something and he's going to he's going to shoot it back to me verbatim <laughs> because he has gone through everything. But again, today, you know, I'm doing some research and I want to ask you this. Uh, uh, Thomas Hugh Harriet. Yeah. Um, is that his real Twitter account? Yeah. OK. Now, I was going through his Twitter account and he mentions you on there frequently. And I came across the, just the clip today about Billy writing backwards, mm -hmm. and then the 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 um, the clip in the book about being mentored by Alistair Crowley. And I was like, "Hold, like I missed that the first time around." But again, it's. He's openly saying that. And like yeah. he said, with Magical Mystery Tour, if I know the occult, I understand that movie. When when Billy is openly saying that, you understand exactly what he's saying. Yeah, it's the occult law of reversal. You know, and that's out of Crowley's book, um, uh, The Book of the Law. And um, and in memoirs, you know, Billy tells us in the blue version that. He was mentored 
by Alistair Crowley in his, in his early years. So yes, uh, so everything is is out there, Vince. I mean, it's, it's hidden in plain sight. And as I've said so many times, you know, uh, Billy has been dropping clues since day one. And people say, oh, you know, Billy's a liar. He's, he's a deceiver. Well, he's only a liar and a deceiver if you don't understand the signs and symbols and what it is that he's putting out there. You know, it's like um, uh, Brian Ray, who is his current guitar player. I put a video up maybe about a week ago or so, and he was being interviewed. And uh, he had said that he's the best Paul McCartney ever or something to that effect. So you, you, you watching that and you're listening to it and the average person, it goes over their head. But once you understand about masterful speaking, where they basically, they could tell you the truth, but they, they kind of encode it, camouflage it in a way. Uh, the first question you ask yourself is he's the best Paul McCartney ever. Well, isn't there only one Paul McCartney? So that's a very strange thing to say, right? Yeah. So it's stuff like that. Um, it's, it's not always going to hit you over the head and be extremely obvious. It's, it's, a lot of it's nuanced. And so you have to learn how to decode the nuances of what's being said and what's being shown. The interesting thing is with Tom, uh, before I actually released the, uh, the, this, the presentation, did the Beatles write all their own music? Um, Tom had uh, PM'd me right before I was going to release it. And uh, I wasn't going to share it with anybody uh, preview wise. I, I did share it with you because we were going to do the show, but I was going to just kind of keep it under wraps until it premiered. And Tom said to me, um, hey, you know, I'm working on an update to uh, the abridged version of memoirs called the book is called Billy's Back. So mm -hmm. evidently, Billy sent the word down that he wants the book updated and it's supposed to come out the summer of this year. So within the next few months or so. And Tom said to me that um, Billy is going to lean into the Lennon McCartney songwriting myth. That it is not what we have been told or what most people, virtually everybody believes. Right. So when Tom said that, I, I wrote him back and I said, well, then you might be interested in my presentation. And I sent him the link. And um, he wrote me back after watching it. And he said, Mike, this is going to speed up disclosure. You know, so this is going to really kick it into high gear. Uh, I didn't get, oh no, this yeah. is a problem, right? It was, okay, this is a good thing. And just so that everybody knows, you know, I, I don't work with Tom. You know, Tom and I have become acquaintances uh, over the last four years because I've been, you know, engrossed in this for four years. But uh, Tom and I do not share what I'm doing and what he's doing. Uh, like he might say to me, he's updating the book, but I have no idea what he's putting in the book. It's like when I, he knew I was doing a, a presentation that had to do with uh, assessing whether the Beatles wrote their own music, but I didn't go back and report back to Tom and tell him what's in the presentation. He just knew I was doing that, yeah. you know? So it's kind of interesting how it all kind of comes together and aligns at the end of the day. So for the folks that are going to be interested in watching my last presentation, just know that within the next couple of months or so, Billy via Tom, and Billy's the guy that's playing Paul McCartney, is going to let some of the cat out of the bag himself. So this whole process of disclosure is, is well underway. And it's kind of interesting, Vince, with everything else going on in the world. I think it's a time when people really are being deluged with information and examples of the illusionary nature of the reality that people think is real, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, so anyway, I, I figured I would put that story out there. Yeah. Mike, I want to ask you, I, I'm, I'm going to turn to my other computer here because, you know, I, I was looking into uh, Tom a little bit today and there was something I want you to clarify for me. And Tom was like answering like the top 12 questions or whatever, you know, about the memoirs. Yeah. Okay. This was one thing I read. I want you to clarify this for me. Um, the question was, did you Harriet really plan this book with Paul McCartney when they met at a beach in Southern California? 
And he answers, you Harriet, who was only seven years old when Paul died in 1966, never met Paul. The story about you Harriet meeting William as Paul on a Southern California beach one hot day after Paul left the recording studio in Los Angeles is merely a legend that was invented in chapter 35, which is fictional, to explain this book. In chapter 35, where his if chapter 35 were historically accurate, that disclosure to you, Harriet, would have constituted a breach of William's non-disclosure agreement, which William would never do. Hence, everyone can be certain that that chance meeting never occurred. Is you Harriet telling us here that he never met Billy? He's saying that um, the decision and the discussion uh, to do the book did not take place where they said they, a, a beach, right? Right. Yes. Right. Yes. That yes. didn't happen. That's that's fiction. So they openly admit that that's a fictional aspect of the book. Um, now, I will explain how I believe it worked. And uh, so let me just take you through it. The Masonic structure is just like a corporation. It's a pyramid, right? So if you work for Exxon or any large corporation, you know, you have your CEO president at the top and then it just branches down. So what happens is think of Billy as having his own pyramid and his own enterprise, if you will. And, when it came time for Billy uh, to disclose, he then went out and looked throughout his corporate structure, if you will, his pyramid for the people that had the right skills and resources to do the work. Tom is a Freemason, right? Billy at this time, is in the what I refer to as the illuminated degrees. In other words, he's above the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. So the way it works is you have the 33, 33 degrees of Freemasonry. Then you have 13 degrees of the Illuminati. And above that, there are 20 degrees that are just basically unknown. They're in the shadows. These are people and beings we will never, never know about. So when it came time to uh, to put the book together, they went out and they tapped into their network. And what Tom did tell me in an email going back a while ago is that he was specifically trained to do encoding. Okay, so to write and, and encode writing. And he explained to me that at the time when it was happening, now I don't know when it took place. I'm assuming it took place when he was younger, when he was a kid. Doesn't sound like something you would do in your adult life, you know? That when he was going through this training, he had no idea what it was for. And, and this is how it works. So how it works is all of this stuff that they do, when I say they, we're talking about the pyramid of power, the Freemasonic structure, the Illuminati, everything is planned years and years and years in advance. So they nurture and groom people along the way. Many times, these people don't even know that they're being groomed and brought along. And then it reaches a point where their skills are honed, and these skills can now be used to, to do whatever. In Tom's case, it was to encode the book. And the, the work that it took for Tom to encode that book is mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely mind-boggling and whenever he has to do an update like he had to update the memoirs of billy shears from the first edition which is dated 2009 to the blue book the second edition which was 2018 he had to make sure that all of the pages all of the encoding stayed in place with updates i, I can't even imagine what it was like to sit there God. and have to put that all together and keep that encoding intact. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. So that's how it works. Um, so that depiction of how they met 
is is fictional. Now, I've asked Tom if he's actually met Billy, and Tom told me that you know he can't answer that question. Okay. I think that's the one time, maybe the one or two times, and he said that it's not something he can answer, and that's because you know Tom has signed non-disclosures as well and confidentiality agreements. It's not just Billy who's bound by contractual obligations. Tom has them as well, as did the the Beatles, by the way. You know, um, Mike, if 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 you know that he hasn't met Billy, would your feelings still be as strong as they are now? Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be um, because, I mean, I, I, I can give you two scenarios. The one scenario would be that he has met Billy and he has conversed with him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it could be, you know, telephone, maybe in person, uh, through email. Um, so direct communication with Billy. I personally believe that, yes, he has. I, I personally believe that he has had direct communication and contact with Billy. Now, whether it was in person, I don't know. But, you know, through, um, like I said, electronic means, telephone, uh, email, stuff like that. Yes, I believe it is that okay. that it, it has. But now the other way it could work is it's like in a corporation. When I used to work in a corporation, I never met or spoke to our CEO ever. But my, our CEO would have uh, would cascade down a strategy that had to be implemented that the corporation had to work on, right? And so people would convene and converge, and they would then bring this strategy or this vision. They would make it a reality, right? They they bring pro products to market and so on. Now. Does that mean that because I never actually met my CEO, that the product that we put out or the deliverables that we put out, uh, it took away from it, that somehow it, it wasn't really what the CEO or the president of the corporation wanted? No, doesn't mean that at all. It's because there is a hierarchy and there is a chain of command. And it's no different when you're dealing with Freemasonry and the pyramid and with Billy. But my own personal take is I do believe that Tom has been in direct communication with Billy. And that's just my take on it. I don't know for sure. Okay, Mike, I want to ask you a question. You kind of just um, went by this uh, because the presentation, again, like I said, guys, four and a half hours. This, this, this was a life's work. I mean, Mike, seriously, the the detail and the information in this is just absolutely incredible. However, you did make a comment which you really didn't get into where, you know, when we talk about Tavistock and we talk about that's where it all began and, and, and you know, what the Beatles were created to do, you made the comment that you think this went well beyond before the cavern, before Hamburg, before Epstein manager, you almost went back to their teens. Yeah. What 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 makes you what what brings you to that theory? Yeah, and I, I intentionally did not dive into that in that presentation, Vince, because it is a theory. And it is one that a lot of people would have a very difficult time getting their heads wrapped around. And so what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to cloud the presentation with that. Okay. But I, mm -hmm. I suspect that um, based upon what I've looked at, that it is very possible that it goes back to when they were kids. So what Vince is referring to is I had said that the Beatles were always on the radar and they were being groomed from very early ages. And I said that I believe it was possible that it went, well, it, was, it started at least when they were back in Hamburg in Germany in the very early 1960s. But I do believe it goes before that, that you know, when they were teenagers and maybe when, even when they were kids. And the reason why I say that, Vince, is because all these gigs they were doing, you know, they were playing nonstop, 
know, seven hours a night. You know, I showed in the presentation, it was like, you know, two thirds of the year they were, they were just grinding it out. Um, there's only re one reason why you do that, you know, uh, and you're doing it with very little to no pay. You're living in, you know, uh, conditions, like especially in Germany, that were just deplorable. You know, all of them sitting in a single room, sleeping at night and, and so on. It's because um, they they were groomed. They were brought along from a very early age. Now, there are pictures out there of, uh, and I put it in the presentation. It was kind of my way of a little bit of a wink and a nod to people who were in the know of Paul McCartney with a birdcage over his head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in Illuminati symbolism, whenever you see a birdcage, a birdcage is, um, it represents mind control. And you see this a lot. You'll see this a lot with celebrities, uh, um, actors and musicians and so on. If you, if you, you know, look at the web and you look up pictures, you're going to see them near bird cages with the bird cage on their head. Um, this is telling us that they are in a mind control program. And so when I got, when I came across the picture of Paul McCartney, biological Paul McCartney with the bird cage, like his head in the bird cage, mm -hmm. that that's the most telltale symbolism that says you're in it. You're not standing next to it. You're in it. And um, I, I believe there's also one with George Harrison, the bird cage too, on his head. So that raised an eyebrow and I became Suspicious. I said, well, you know what? I think what we're being shown here and what we're being told is that they were subjected to trauma-based mind control. And that would take place very early on in your age. Trauma-based mind control doesn't take place when you're older, right? They have to basically break everything down early on in your life. So people would then say, well, does that mean that their parents were involved in this? You know, I, I'm not going to go there because I don't want to accuse anybody of anything. All I'm going to say is, is that if they were in a mind control program at an early age, people had to know they were in these programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, trauma-based mind control programs doesn't necessarily mean that everything is bad and evil. You know, um, there, there are positive uh, aspects of trauma-based mind control. In other words, there's a reward system as an example, right? I'm not saying trauma-based mind control is positive. There are both negative and positive applications of it. As an example, let's just say there's a young boy that plays football and his father is, uh, is a big time football you know, coach and he's coaching the team, his son's on it. And let's just say that, you know, he's, he's, he's grooming his son to be a star. We've seen this so many times, right? Mm -hmm. And let's just say his son is a running back and then he fumbles the ball. After the game, what does the father do? Right? In, in a lot of cases, what happens is the father becomes irate. How could you have done this? You broke your focus. Get down, do 500 push-ups you know, run around the block 500 times, right? Get your head back together. You know, this can't happen again. That's trauma-based mind control. That that child, is their mind is being shaped at that moment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if that same kid on the, in the next game actually runs 90 yards and, and scores a touchdown, the father's application at that point is to rain praise on his child. Pat him on the back. Let's go out to dinner, son. You did a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just, you're head and shoulders above everybody else. That's the positive aspect of a trauma-based mind control program. So there's, there's two sides of the coin, if you will. So Billy tells us in the memoirs of Billy Shears that he was in a mind control program, a trauma-based mind control program. I mean, that's in the book. Mm -hmm. That's not up for debate. I mean, that's in the book. It's uh, one of the uh, one of the longer footnotes that Tom put in there. 
And although it doesn't say anything about biological Paul or, or any of the other Beatles having been in any of these types of programs, um, you know, when I see birdcage symbolism, that makes me very suspicious. Yeah. And that's why I didn't go into it in the, um, in the presentation fence, because it would have been just over yeah. the head of too many people. You know, they just would, what is, what is this guy talking about? Mike, I want to ask you another question because I'm just curious if these roads intersect because I've not really seen you go into this. And perhaps you you have and I just missed it. I've been watching a lot on Peace Pete Best lately. And, uh, you know, from, from what I'm understanding, Pete Best was really maybe the most popular Beatle. Yeah, uh, he had a following. They loved him. He was very, very popular. Out of nowhere, Pete Best was replaced. Yeah, and Pete Best, when you see some of the interviews, you know he he comes out and he says he thinks it was because of jealousy, because there was more attention on him than the other people. Do, do those roads intersect? Was was that a part of uh, of Tavis stock? Do you believe, or is that just a, a band outing a drummer? Yeah, so we have to, uh, there were three phases to the Beatles, so we have to start there. Phase one of the Beatles was the Beatles with Stu Sutcliffe and Pete Best. This was the early Beatles back in Hamburg, playing the Cavern and all that stuff, right? Then we had phase two of the Beatles. This was the Ringo Starr period where we had John, Paul, George, and Ringo. And this was the, the period or the phase where they were recording and playing live, doing tours and concerts and live gigs. Phase three was the Billy era. Sergeant Pepper on. Now, the thing with Pete Best is um, if if we want the, I think, the, the truest story, it is in memoirs on page 350 where uh, Billy explains that Pete was replaced because George Martin didn't think much of him as a drummer. And so I think what they were looking at at that point was not so much recording because we, I guess we'll get into that in a little bit, but they were... George Martin was thinking in terms of playing live. So the, what I took from that was Pete didn't have the chops to do the live stuff, right? Ringo did. So what we were, what I'm saying is that George Martin determined that Ju uh, Ringo was a better drummer than Pete and for what they needed to do next, which was to play these concerts uh, going through 1966. So if you're playing in small clubs and bars and stuff like that, Pete was okay. But once we stepped it up and we got out of bars and clubs and we got to concerts, then they had Ringo as the drummer. But as I've said in my presentation, that's where that's where Ringo, that's where the kind of like it, the road ended for him. That in those early albums from Please Please Me, released in 1963 through Revolver, in August of 1966, Ringo didn't play on those albums. Those were studio drummers that were playing on those albums. Probably a shock to a lot of people who haven't watched the uh, the presentation. So, so to answer your question, I, I believe Pete was outed. Uh, excuse me, he was ousted because uh, I'm going to take memoirs at its word. It's because George Martin, who was a who was the primary player, the protagonist in this whole thing, yes. decided he wasn't the guy. Let's talk about George Martin for a second, because here's one thing that I'm very, I'm, 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 I'm a little confused about. When you start off your presentation, and um, you know we 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 hear about um, Brian Epstein and the meeting with uh, George Martin and the introduction of the Beatles. Okay, yeah. George Martin pulls no punches. And he says on several occasions, like they were not very good. And 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 again, I, I think a lot of people know this, but we, we got to go back to the cavern and the early days. They were a cover band, right? They were a cover band, but there were so many instances and 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 interviews that you pulled out early on where he basically said he saw nothing in them. That it, it, it kind of felt like they had charisma and right. they fit the bill almost like you know we could look at today we could look at NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys and all those boy bands you know or the monkeys 
The monkeys. Yeah, it's so it, it sounded like he was saying they had the charisma. They, they maybe they had the it factor, but on a musical level, they were lousy. And the words are coming from his mouth. But then we fast forward to the rubber soul and the success. And I love the one clip you have explained to everybody what the finger over the mouth means, because you could explain that much better than me. Okay. So in Freemasonry, you know, they have this symbolism. So when you see a Freemason do this, that's the symbol for tell no secrets. I call it the hush symbolism, like hush, quiet. And um, so there was a uh, there was an interview that was in uh, a DVD which was about George Martin. It's called "Produced by George Martin," and I watched that DVD, you know. And so he was being interviewed by Howard Goodall, and Howard is a composer himself. He's a broadcaster and composer. He's very accomplished. And so Mr. Goodall, during that interview, was asking George some questions. And then he says, I have to ask you this one question. And so George Martin says, okay, yeah, no problem. And so Mr. Goodall starts asking about the, the composition and the complexities of songs like Yesterday, Eleanor Rigby, Blackbird. And it's interesting. If you watch that clip closely, it's as if when Mr. Goodall asked George Martin that question, I don't think George Martin was expecting that question. Mm -hmm. Because if you notice, Vince, he straightens up in his chair. You know, George is sitting there. Howard asks him the question. And then George straightens up. And it's almost like, whoa. And the problem with Mr. Goodall asking that question is because he's a composer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's a formally trained musician and composer. And so when that comes from a peer and they're asking that question, that's questioning the official narrative. And so when Mr. Goodall was playing some of the, giving some examples of how the songs were constructed, remember he was playing the piano, giving some brief examples, George does this. So he's listening to, to Mr. Goodall, and he still has his finger up like this. And then once Mr. Goodall finishes explaining, his, you know, getting through his question and giving his examples on the piano, George then does what he does best, which is he directs the conversation, the answer back to John and Paul. He says, oh, no, they wrote it. They really did. They really did. And you know, if I had wrote them, I would have made you know a lot of money. And then I I jumped at the clip where George Martin then says he wrote the melody line to Michelle. He says that was his composition. So when when that happened, again, it's it, when you're able to decode the signs and symbols, and you don't have to know it, all of them. I mean, you know, just the basic ones. Whenever you see this, that's that just means you know. We're going to keep silent, keep quiet. You know, we're not going to reveal any secrets. When he did that during that uh, particular segment of the presentation, when Mr. Goodall was asking him the question about those songs, that immediately said to me that the Beatles, John and Paul specifically, did not write those songs. Okay, that's and and that's how and that's how I interpreted it. Why would he, why would he, um, I mean, why would he then early on uh, hold no, uh, you know, pull no punches about them not being good musicians? And I mean, what, wouldn't from the get go, he build these guys up to be more than they actually were? Yeah. So I think what happened was, and again, this is just a guess because it is kind of weird in, in the beginning He's telling us that he didn't like the music. Mm -hmm. He said he thought the music was rubbish. Yeah. His yep. words, right? Yeah. Yep. That they didn't have much behind them. And basically he had said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with these guys. He was kind of looking at a lead and no, he said, none of them is stands above the others. 
so basically what he's saying is I've got an equal lot of these of four guys here. And what do I do with them? And then he said, I'll just take them on as a band. Right. So I think what happened, and again, this is just me mm -hmm. kind of uh, reading into it. I think initially when the Beatles were presented to him, George didn't want anything to do with them because that, that wasn't, George is an accomplished musician, arranger, composer, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's thinking, what, 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 what am I going to do with this? Mm -hmm. And Tavistock had a whole pool of these, these bands, you know, around and what they do is they have a pool of resource that they pull from. The Rolling Stones came from the same pool, by the way, the stones are also a creation of Tavistock as is the who and the rest of them. Um, I think what happened was people above George Martin said, okay, look, that's interesting that you don't like them, George, but they're the guys. They're the chosen ones. They're, they're the ones that we're going to yeah. push forward with. Okay. So I can appreciate the fact that this is going to be a lot of work on your part. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but <laughs> you have to go do this. Yeah. And because uh, even in the book, um, I think it was on page 351 of Memoirs, uh, Billy mentions that the word came from a, a couple of rungs above George Martin. Yeah. You see? So even though Memoirs does not specifically question who wrote the music, um, there are little clues hidden inside Memoirs that will help you to validate what I did as an example. Yeah. Right. So it's neither it's neither denying or confirming in memoirs. Yeah. But once you kind of grab on to uh, a specific thread and you follow it, you find that, oh, you know what? I think perhaps this is what I'm being told in the book. So that's what I think happened. I think initially um, because people like to think that they're all rowing in the same direction. You know, it, it's not it's not the case. Um it's like even the way it is in business, you might have disagreements amongst various vice presidents or executives within a corporation. And I don't think we should go there. The other guy thinks you should. And then what happens is from a, a, a layer above or two layers above, they'll say, okay, discussion's over. This is where we're going. Yeah. And this is what we're going to do. Yeah. So I believe the same thing happened there. Yeah. Let's talk. I want to talk smoke and gun now, you know, the, to me, and, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your answer to this, Mike, to me, you know, doing all the research, uh, uh, reading the you Harriet book. I mean, everything I've been seeing since I'm a seven year old kid to me, the smoking gun in the Paul is dead theory. The smoking gun to me is the arrest in Japan. Yeah. And then, and the fingerprints not matching up, and and, and Billy thought gigs up, man, like gigs right. up. That to me is the smoking gun here, like clearly. And and I want you to you know go into this, the Mercy Beat article in yeah. 1962. That's a smoking like, gun. If, if this happened in 1962. What would make you think it didn't happen in 63 and 64 and 65 and 66? Listen, Mike, you and I both listen to a lot of music. You, you are a musician. You listen to a lot more than me. But I could tell you in my whole life of listening to music, even before you put together this unbelievable presentation, there is not one musical group out there not one that literally changed their style year after year after year after year like they were two three four totally different bands not one zeppelin sounded like zeppelin who sounded like who stones still sound like the stones pink floyd simon and garfunkel i'm a writer I there there is a way I write. When I write something, you know it's Vince Russo. Th this was completely different from the early albums. Please, please me. Then we went into the Help Rubber Soul Revolver stage. Then all of a sudden, Sergeant Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. Then we go to the White Album. Like 
to think this is the same style of these same four individuals, there's no way, no how. But talk about that smoking gun in 1962 where we're told. Yeah, so in the presentation, um, and I, I can't, you know, I'll give credit to one of my friends uh, who sent this to me. Um, I won't mention them by name because some, some folks don't want me <laughs> uh, to, to mention their names, but they sent me this, um, uh, this clip, uh, an image of a Mercy Beat uh, publication from, I think it was August, September of 1962. Mm -hmm. And in it, it was an article about the Beatles. And it was an article announcing that Pete Bass left the group and Ringo Starr was the new drummer. And the Beatles were flying to London to record uh, with EMI and that the songs were specifically written for them and given to them by their producer, George Martin. Okay. So it doesn't say that they wrote their own songs. It said that the songs were specifically written for them. And this goes back to 1962, right before they headed in to go record, um, you know, their, their first album, uh, please, please me. And um, so, and actually even before that, because Please Please Me was released in 1963. So, so that, that article uh, was unbelievable. When it, when it was shown to me, I, I read that, I, I said to myself, okay, well, how are you going to get around this? Mm -hmm. You can't, you, you just can't, you know. Um, but there, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, information that I received Vince throughout that I presented throughout the presentation uh, that maybe not as black and white as that uh, were situations or circumstances that, that we're told in the official narrative that once you really analyze it, it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. Then you go through, I mean, we talk about a lot of plagiarism mm -hmm. and a lot of their songs sounding like popular songs that were already out there it, it almost seemed I, I i mean mike do you think there it, it seems to me after watching your presentation there were many writers and those writers changed over time according to the time was that your takeaway yeah i believe that um from 62 to 66 uh they had a core group of writers that were writing for them and, um, and, you know, there were times when they lifted riffs from other songs, you know, and I, and I have this in the presentation. And if you watch the presentation, I, I give the examples and, uh, you know, it's possible that they did that because they were able to get away with it, you know, that mm -hmm. you just change up the lyrics a little bit, or maybe just change the mel melody line a little bit. And, uh, there you go. I mean, uh, like I said, if you watch the presentation, I, I, I give examples of this stuff. So, but one of our team members, uh, and again, I, I, I won't give out any names, but is a very accomplished composer and arranger. And um, he analyzed uh, the music and he had said that even within the 1962 through 66 period, if we go back to like 1965 and 1966, where we have Revolver and, and uh, well, it was in 66 and Rubber Soul in 1965, that there are stylistic differences in the music there uh, uh, for songs that are credited to Paul McCartney. So what, what this team member was saying is these are quote unquote McCartney songs, but he was able to, to detect clear style differences in style in writing of those songs. And um, so I, I believe that there was a core group of writers that were involved in that period. I don't know how many people have asked me, oh, Mike, do you know the names of any of these people? No, I don't know the names of any of these people. Um, these people are going to be uncredited unless somebody steps forward. Somebody like Bernard Purdy, who didn't write songs, but he stepped forward and back in the 1970s and said that he was hired to drum on 21 Beatles songs on the early records, on the early albums. Mm -hmm. So until we get more people to step forward like that, it's, it's not going to be possible to figure out who these folks are. I have been given some names by people who say that they know people who claim that they were ghost writers for the Beatles. 
but I didn't put that into the presentation because I had no way to validate that. I had no way to verify it. I wasn't going to put somebody's name out there uh, because somebody else told me that, you know, they believe this person was involved in that process. So, uh, and then we can see, like you said, Vince, then the songwriting changes very, it's very, very different starting with Sergeant Pepper. Mm -hmm. So there was a different clue of songwriters starting with Pepper. And I believe what happened there was, you know, Billy was the, was the clearly the driver behind the Beatles when he took over the band in late 1966. And I think Billy then recruited um, people that he knew Yeah, that, you know, some of the names that I've heard, you know, popular names that were potentially um, in that songwriting clues or that stream were Harry Nielsen, um, Neil yeah, Innes from the Ruddles. Le Lennon and Harry Nielsen were very, very tight. Yeah. Neil Innes from the Ruddles. Now, you know, because Neil wrote a lot of the Ruddles, obviously the Ruddle and the Bonzo Dog Band. He was mm -hmm. in the in the Bonzos with Billy, right? Now, I don't know whether Harry wrote the songs or whether Neil wrote those songs, but these are some of the names that have floated out there that are recognizable. Um, Junior Campbell is another name that's popped up. Um, so, but who knows? I, I don't know. But the songwriting is very different, starting with Pepper. Um, when you compare it to the pre-Pepper era, 62 to 66. Very, very different songwriting. Now, Mike, you also make this statement. I'm, I'm curious to um, I'm curious to hear your take on this. Um, if this were an opinion or, again, this was something out of uh, memoirs, but you also believe that Billy was behind the scenes prior to 67. Yeah. Billy could have been working on some of this music prior to Pepper. What brings you to that, to that thought? Well, there was an article that came out about a year ago or so and uh, where Billy said that he wrote the music to In My Life, which is a song on Rubber Soul. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and John Lennon had said in the past that uh, Billy was only involved in writing a small portion of the song. But Billy came out and said, no, I wrote the melody, the music, and John wrote the lyrics. Now, this is a very perplexing thing. So what happened was the mainstream media at that point went into damage control. And so they said they, they ran computer models because these computer models models were able to pick up the styles of each individual beetle. And they said, no, nah, uh, they know him as Paul McCarty, right? They call him Paul McCarty. They said, no, nah, he just misremembered. And in, in my presentation, I said, the probability that he would misremember writing a song like In My Life when it's one of the most famous Beatles songs of all time. I think Rolling Stone had its 100 greatest Beatles songs and In My Life was number five. Yeah. And any kind of music poll of greatest songs of all time in rock, In My Life ranks very, very high. There is no way yeah. Billy misremembered that. There is no way. So if we know Billy, right, we understand Billy. He likes to drop clues. This is what he does. And so I think what Billy was doing was he was saying, yeah, that was my song. I wrote the music to it, which means he was there before he was there. Yeah, yeah. Right? Which actually, Vince, when you think about it, would make sense. Because it would make the assimilation of Billy into the band a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. Because he was already working with him. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to start working with George Martin now in the creation of Sgt. Pepper. I don't think that's the case at all anymore. I really do believe that Billy was there. And I believe he was there starting in 1965. It's very possible we're hearing his influences on the Help album and Rubber Soul. Yeah, you know, you know, it's funny, Mike, that you mentioned that because – it's a little sketchy. This is where you go from the fiction to the nonfiction. Again, in the You Harriet book was when five days after biological Paul was killed, I believe it was in Paris. Yeah. That uh and it was it Epstein. It was Epstein, right? It was in Ep France. Yeah, he, he met with he met Epstein there to talk to John. But isn't that where Epstein introduced him to Billy? That's what the book says that, yeah, that Epstein and uh, Billy showed up and they were going to meet with John. And that's where Billy said that he had his his criteria. Right. And one of the criteria of doing this 
was that he had full creative control of the Beatles right. from that point going forward, right. that John relinquished control of the band, right? That's what's told to us in the book. Right. And then that's, in 67, you see another drastic change in music. But that still doesn't mean that Billy wasn't there. All it says to me is, is that Billy was the guy that was eventually tapped. He could still have been working with the, with the band and with George Martin prior to right. 1966, right? Yeah. So, um, and in, you know, in all likelihood, uh, John Lennon knew, I knew, John Lennon knew who he was. Yeah. Right. Probably just didn't know at the time that he was going to be the guy tapped to, to take the, the lead role. Yeah. Right. So yeah, that's, that's how I kind of read into it. We, we, we're going to get to, I'm looking at my clock cause I know how much time. Yeah, I no, have. no worries. We, we're going to get to a uh, rubber soul at the end. But there were other tidbits. Like you, you drop little bombshells in this thing because there's so many, like it's nothing. He, well, he, here's something that blew me away. Well, but Vince, before we do that, one more thing I wanted to mention was the clip where I have Ringo explaining he called the songwriters they. Yeah, I, and, and I saw another clip where he did the same thing, the writers. I, the Ringo, writers. I, I said that to you, and I'm like, that's weird, bro. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. say John and Paul. He says the writers. Yeah, and, and then how many times do we? I, I, one of my uh, my background right now on my computer is from your presentation, where the four of them are reading out of prepared books of music. Yeah, but but here's another bombshell you dropped on me, where I was like, oh, this was an oh by the way, <laughs> Ed Sullivan was a part of this. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know. Um, that's in the book, The Committee of 300 by Dr. John Coleman. He explains this. But then to validate that, uh, there's a clip in the presentation where you hear George saying that, uh, I believe it was George, where he said that uh, uh, Ed Sullivan had met them in London. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of people like to, uh, when it comes to the Beatle part of the book, The Committee of 300 by John Coleman, uh, they'll say the rest of the book is brilliant. But the parts of the Beatles they don't like because it basically just tears apart the story, right? Right, right. But you know, yeah, he said that uh, Ed Sullivan uh, was uh, he was tapped to be the focal point to introduce them into the United States, and that you know he had made trips out to London uh, to meet with the band and to basically get his uh, his script and his orders as to how he was going to proceed. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And we know the entertainment industry is completely controlled along with the music industry. So why would that, you know, boggle anybody's mind? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here's another, this I love, you know, I, I, I'm writing down so many of these, uh, you know, I'm going, you know, through everything, you know, Andy White, you know, uh, drummed for Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. Yeah. Um, then, you know, B Bernard Purdy claimed to have uh, 21 songs. Then we got, you said this earlier, George Martin. They had the charisma. I thought their music was rubbish. But he is the one that's like, holy crap. You know, you're talking about the great songwriting team of Lennon and McCartney, the great composers. Quincy Jones, non-playing MFers. Yeah. Woof. That was devastating. That was devastating. And, you know, and then there was this, uh, again, there was damage control and uh, where the press played it up that yeah. Quincy uh, apologized and he misspoke and all this stuff. But, you know, then I found the tweet where he allegedly apologized. Yeah. He didn't retract anything. Right, right, right. He just said, I'm sorry for bad mouthing. That's all he said. He did not take back what he had said about their playing abilities, which he said they couldn't play. Now, folks, some folks, they get angry with me for saying stuff like that. Don't get angry at me. Quincy Jones said this. I'm just telling you what Quincy said in Spin Magazine. God, this, I mean, he's talking about the monkeys. <laughs> it's unbelievable to me, but which leads us to rubber soul. Yeah. Now, Mike, I'm looking at this whole thing. And again, um, this song was written, rehearsed, recorded, uh, start to finish in 30 days between October 11th and November 11th. Correct. Right. Okay. That's the yeah. story, right? That is the story. Now, to me, again, another smoking gun. 
is the actual time it takes to manufacture an album, which we'll get into. Okay. But when we look at this October 11th through November 11th, Mike, we do look at, I believe just prior to this, September 2nd, 1965. Okay. The Beatles did have a six week break or hiatus. Right. Could this music not have been written in those six weeks? People have brought that up. And the first thing I have to, you know, I tell people is, first of all, that's not the official narrative. The official narrative says that they had uh, no existing material other than little bits and pieces of Michelle and a couple of other songs, right? But no, no complete songs. And actually, just like... Uh, with Michelle, I think they said that they had the, the, the riff and we're trying to remember what it was. But in any case, they, they didn't have uh, any backlog of material and they were on the hook to record 16 original compositions between October 11th and November 11th. Now, people have come back to me and they have said, um, well, why couldn't they have written the songs during the break between coming back from the tour on September 2nd, six weeks, leading into October 11th. Well, my response to them is that, well, first of all, you're making up a new story because that's not the narrative that's given to us. But let's just set that aside for a second. Let's just say that they got off this hectic touring, which was 16 cities in 16 days, including one stop in Canada on the U.S. tour in 1965 in August. And as soon as they got off that airplane, they sat down, they got together as a band, and they started writing music. This means that they would have the whole band would have had to convene, come together, start writing music, melodies, harmonies, and George Martin is going to have to participate because he has to do the arranging. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 16 songs. So even given six weeks to do 16 songs coming off a tour is, is really, it's, it's not possible. People want to believe it's possible because they'll say, well, they were geniuses and, you know, they had abilities beyond uh, the average or the, even some of the most talented musicians because, you know, they were just capable of doing these things. But the truth of the matter is the Beatles have never called themselves geniuses. They never called themselves, you know, prodigies or any of that stuff. In fact, you know, John Lennon in the 1980 interview in Playboy said that they couldn't read or write music. None of them were technically good musicians, mm -hmm. right? So we have to go with what the official narrative is telling us. The official narrative doesn't say anything about them writing material during a six-week break. And even if they did, when they got into the studio on October 11th, they would have had to have been so polished, had those songs down to the point where they could play them in their sleep in order to make it through that 30 days. That it's it's just not it's it's not feasible. Well, and it also, you know, Mike, think about it for a second. Think about it logically, because I'm really a logic guy and I always go back to logic and I know what it is like when we had a television taping. And we were going to record eight shows. Okay, Vince, you got to write these eight shows before we get there. You know, I mean, I know what the schedule is. Think, think about this. They know they're going into the studio October 11th to record a whole album. The narrative tells us they showed up on October 11th with nothing. So right. in other words, during those six weeks, they know... In six weeks, we got to go into the studio. We have one month to record an album, and they're going to go into that studio with nothing. The only way they're going to go into that studio with nothing is if that work is already done for them. Exactly. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Exactly. All those songs were written. The, um, the basic tracks, at the very least, and the arranging, I believe, was already done. But the, the music for the songs was completely done, recorded, and already mixed down. While they were on tour and doing their thing, this is what was going on 
behind the scenes with studio musicians and George Martin arranging the music. And again, I, you know, I have to keep making this point. The official narrative says that they walked into the Rubber Soul sessions with nothing, basically nothing. And they had to create those songs from scratch, blank sheet of paper, starting on, on October 11th. And um, so, you know, and to be honest with you, you know, I wasn't, I didn't even pay attention or was aware of this timeline until I, I watched that DVD that I mentioned in the presentation and, you know, where the presenter is uh, taking us through the timeline. And I got like 10 minutes into it. And I remember thinking to myself, this is impossible. Yeah. This is not possible. And, uh, and the other thing I tried to explain in the presentation, Vince, is that when songwriters write, you don't just sit down and go, okay, well, I'm going to write a song and you bang it out. And you're like, okay, here we go. Here's one song. You know, there's a lot of puts and takes. A lot of songs get started and then they get shelved because you might have a good start to a song, a good verse. You don't have a good chorus. Maybe you need a bridge, but you don't have a bridge yet to the song. It's a creative process. It's not something where you just crank it out. It's not like, you know, you're on an assembly line and that's how you make songs or how you write songs. And for people who are not songwriters, this sometimes is difficult for them to get their heads wrapped around because the official story tells us that they were basically magicians. I mean, they could just create this stuff on the spot because they were just brilliant and they were geniuses. But so many people that follow my work are songwriters and musicians. And, you know, they've come back to me and said, mm -mm, that didn't happen. Yeah. 16 songs in 30 days, starting from scratch, didn't happen. Yeah. You know, and, and Mike, that's only half the story. Right. Because now we get into the manufacturing and say, you know, uh, somehow, some way they were able to come up with these 16 masterpieces in, in 30 days. But now there's another problem because they're, they're, they're finished with the session by November 11th. Right. The album is, they want the album to be released December 3rd for the holidays. Right. So when we look at November 11th to December 3rd, we're looking at less than a month. We're looking at literally, uh, what, what are you looking at? You're looking at 29, you, well, you're looking at about, no, 19, 20, you're looking at about three weeks. Yeah. You're looking at about three weeks. Well, in order to manufacture an album, and Mike, I want you to take us through the steps because I don't think people really understand the finished product and what that takes. But when you look at the timeline of how, how long it takes to manufacture these albums and re release the, these albums, we're looking at six to eight weeks. Yes. They did it in three weeks. So now you've got a a, a, a a bigger issue on top of what's already a big issue. If somehow they did these show, th these in 30, in 30 days, how in God's name did they release an album in three weeks when they had to have it pressed the label walk us through that, Mike? Well, the thing is when you release a record, it's not just about recording songs. Okay. Obviously you have to record songs to have tracks on a record, but you also have to press the records and you have to create the record labels, the labels that get pressed onto the vinyl. You have to create the LP or record jackets with you have to have photo shoots and um, all of this stuff. And in order to put all of that together, you have to have the, the names of the songs, the sequencing, what order the songs are in, you have to have the uh, the run times of the songs. Mm -hmm. You have to have all of this stuff. And so the the process of um, of creating a record is is involves printing, going through the printing process. It's the stamping of the records. It's bringing the records and the record jackets together, and then staging the records for distribution, and then getting the records out to to retail outlets. What happened was when I was working with one of my team members who has been in the record business for a long time, 
it understands the record pressing um, process, the cycle time. He, he knows he knows how it works. He's not guessing. He knows exactly how it works. So when I was going through this and I said, okay, well, they finished up on November 11th and then the lacquer was cut on November 17th. So what the lacquer is, folks, is the lacquer is the is the final, think of it as the, the final pressing of the record, an acetate that then creates a stamper. So you don't take a, you don't take a lacquer to make records. A lacquer, first of all, the lacquer has to be tested. You have to make sure that the lacquer is good, right? Once you go through that process, mm -hmm. you create stampers. And the stampers are what actually press the records into the vinyl. So this is the point I'm trying to make is this this whole process, and it's not something that is easily expedited. And the whole bit about getting the record sleeves printed, you have to get that process started because you have what's called four ink printing process. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, it's you know it's a little different today because we have everything's digital today. But back in the day, when when you created record sleeves, the picture that you see on the front of the vinyl, that had to go to a through a printing process. You know, with four colors, you run the four colors, it creates the actual picture, but then it needs, you know, a few days to dry before you could do anything with it. So the point I'm trying to make is that this is not just snap your fingers and everything just comes together. Right? So there is a, a cycle time. There's a period of time that's required to be able to get a record out to uh, from the day the lacquer is cut to release it when it ends up in a retail outlet. When I took my colleague through these dates, okay, I showed it to him and I said, mm -hmm. the lacquer was cut on November 17th and they got the stores in the record, uh, the, the records in the store on December 3rd. He said, it's impossible. I said, okay. <laughs> he said, didn't happen. It's impossible. I said, all right. So I said, explain to me. He said, Mike, when you make, when you print the record jackets, he says, you have, you have to have a photo shoot. Fine. Okay. It's fine. He says, but you have to have the names of the songs. Mm -hmm. He says, before you could do any printing. So if you're going to make the, you know, the, the record album, the sleeve, and many times on the back of the album, there's, you know, almost all of the time, there's the song list of the songs. You have to know them. You can't make the record jacket and then add the songs later. It's, it's, it's all one process. He says the same thing with the record label itself, the round label that goes on the vinyl. You have to have the names of the songs. And he said, there is no way that when that lacquer got cut, and the and that's basically, let's just say maybe a few days before that, they had the list of the songs before the lacquer, right? Recording ended on November 11th, lacquer cut on November 17th. Let's just say in between that period of time, that's when George Martin had the final list of songs. He said there was no time to get that printing process done from after November 11th to having the record released on December 3rd. Didn't happen. He says that process is a six-week process. And so he says you have to back it up. And a lot of times back in the day, I was told it's eight weeks. So we used six weeks because six weeks, we, you know, I felt, okay, I'm going to use an expedited timetable here. Let's just say EMI pulled out all the stops to get that record out. And so I gave them the benefit of the doubt. But the truth of the matter is the six weeks that I use in my presentation is aggressive. And that the actual time period back in the day, back in the 1960s was probably seven to eight weeks. But again, I gave them the benefit of the doubt. So I hope this is making sense. So what that means is that we are told, the official story tells us that the Beatles finished 
four songs on the very last day of recording. You won't see me, girl, wait, and I'm looking through you on the very last day. So that means that George Martin wouldn't have had the actual complete list of songs until the very last day. Maybe a little bit before if they were saying, well, this is the name of the song, right? Maybe. And not on, But not only the songs, the times of each song. The times of the songs. That's the, the times of the song they right. had to know. Right. So the thing is, if you're recording and you don't, I mean, if they were actually doing recording, they would not know the exact times of those songs. So this creates a gigantic problem. It, it creates a huge, huge problem for the timetable. And the thing is, nobody has really ever looked at it before. And I wouldn't have looked at it if I didn't watch that DVD. And it was when I watched that DVD, see what, what set it off for me was 16 brand new songs in 30 days. And I said, impossible. I didn't even blank. I said, that didn't happen. And then once I started investigating some more, and then it was explained to me the whole process to, to press a record, and to get it out for sale in a retail outlet, the, the, the cycle time for that, six to eight weeks, I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, this the whole thing just collapses. It's like a house of cards. So I, I hope I explained that well enough, Vince. But yeah. to net it out for the folks, look, in order for them to have had the record sleeves done in time to insert the records, all of that stuff would have had to have started before the Beatles got into the studio, before they got into the studio. So what that means is the songs were already recorded, which means the songwriters wrote the songs, the songs were brought into the studio way before October 11th. Yeah, Mike, you said that in the presentation, you said that the, the wreckage should have been sent out by October 22nd for a December 3rd release. That's when it should, if, if, if this were going according to the time, it should have went out October 22nd. It went out November 11th. That's when the, uh, that's when the whole process uh, about with regard to the record sleeves would have had to have been wrapped up no later than October 22nd. Mm -hmm. Right. October 11th, I said, but no later, no later than October 22nd. So that means, so what I'm trying to say, folks, I know if you watch the presentation, it's a lot clearer. It's, it's hard to do here without the slides. But what that means is while the Beatles were uh, finishing up their Christmas shows in early uh, 1965, then doing the European tour, uh, filming Help, recording the Help album. Uh, and then doing their U.S. tour in August, while they were doing all that stuff, behind the scenes, what was going on was the songs were, were written and recorded by studio musicians, session musicians. And so this way, what happened was when the music was all was done, George Martin already knew the times of the songs. Mm -hmm. He knew the names of the songs. He can sequence the songs for the album. So all that stuff was done. The photo shoot was done. So we have the names of the songs. We have the times of the songs. We have the sequencing, all of that, the, the, the photo shoot. Guess what? Now we can package the album sleeves and we can print the labels, the round labels for the vinyl. Mm -hmm. So we send that off. That's in the pipeline now. Music's done. When the Beatles show up on October 11th, what George Martin had was he had the music already recorded and already mixed down. That was already done. All they had to do was sing, was sing the songs. And so that's, in, based upon my work, that's what they did between October 11th and November 11th. The 30 days, they didn't write, rehearse, and record the music. They sang, a la the monkeys. That's what happened. And you know, and I have clips in there where I'm showing yeah, how yeah. they're struggling with trying to get "Think for Yourself" down. Mm -hmm. And you know that that actual uh, video clip, Vince, went on a lot longer. I actually had to edit it so that I wouldn't bore people out of their skulls listening to it. But the bits I left in were indicative of you know what was going on. They were joking around. They were horsing around. They couldn't get the melody line. You could see they were struggling with the harmonies. 
you know, so this is why it came down to the wire. It was because, you know, this, this was a challenge for them. It's, I know for people who haven't watched the presentation, this is going to sound like heresy, uh, but you know, Mike, when, you know, it, it was very, uh, it was very, very, and, and it doesn't end there, but it was very, very dramatic to me when you, you know, you gave your conclusion Yeah. after all this. So my, listen, Mike, you were just so nice, man. You just sent me two wonderful albums in the mail, <laughs> uh, which I am so thankful and so grateful for. It's like freaking gold to me. And then, you you know, you've told me a couple of times about your, ex, your extensive Beatle collection. I know what a Beatle fan you are. I know what they mean to you and what they've meant to your life. How do you feel? I actually, I become actually um, numb to it in a way. Uh, I don't want to say numb, but dissociated from the Beatles. Um, you know, it, it's it's a huge disappointment. It is. I'm not going to say that it's not. In previous shows, I've, I've told folks that, you know, the luster is gone. But after I did this, it was really... It was really quite shocking, you know, to think that, all right, you know, we're down to they were doing the vocals. That's it. And uh, and I had to conclude that that's exactly what they were doing through the first seven albums. You know, when you have look, when they tell us that Andy White drummed on Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You, those are two songs that they want to tell us about. My, my, my guess is Andy White drummed on a lot more songs than those two and Andy's not with us anymore. Right. And I'm sure Andy had to sign some kind of confidentiality agreement so that, you know, he wouldn't say anything. Bernard Purdy, yeah. who was a world renowned drummer. He spent 25 years with Aretha Franklin. I mean, give me a break. And people want to say that Bernard's out of his mind. And uh, Bernard, I, I, Bernard loved misremembered. I, I loved my, Mike has a, a, a footage of Bernard, which, which I loved because during this, you, you're kind of seeing the guy's character. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're seeing him, you're listening to him. And, you know, he did not come across as somebody that's just going to make this up on no. a room for no reason. And he caught a lot of grief. He yeah. got a lot of grief for saying what he did. And, um, you know, but then he came out with his book in uh, 2014, Let the Drums Speak. And he has a chapter dedicated to the Ringo Starr controversy. And, um, Bernard does not back off the story. He says that he drummed on 21 songs on the, uh, the early albums. So somebody could say, well, you know, they, they released 77 songs over the first seven albums. So does that mean that Ringo drummed on 50 of them? No, it doesn't mean that at all. I don't think Ringo drummed on any of those songs. And if you listen very, you know, very closely, listen to the drumming, it's the timekeeping is very precise. It's precision. Yeah. And so what that means is that they had other session drummers aside from Bernard and aside from Andy White. And like we said, we don't know. Maybe Andy White drummed on a lot of the early stuff. They just told us about two songs, Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. And uh, and then when you listen to the drumming after uh, Revolver, which was the last of the first seven albums, you hear different drumming. You, you do. You do hear different drumming. And in fact, if you listen to Lady Madonna, I, that's not Ringo on Lady Madonna. That's not Ringo. And in, in my view, I mean, it, it, again, we're back to that very precise timekeeping, very tight drumming. And um, so, you know, I do think Ringo drummed on songs, starting with Sgt. Pepper. But even then, he was paging in and out. We know Billy drummed on songs on the White Album. Mm -hmm. Back in the USSR, Dear Prudence, Martha, My Dear. Uh, he did the Ballad of John and Yoko. You know, that was his Billy drumming on that song, which wasn't on the White Album, but later on, you know. So this is not, you know, I don't know. But then, Mike, you weren't done there because, again, you did this whole presentation based on a, a DVD. I think it's called The Deconstructing of Rubber Soul. Yeah. But then, Mike, you know, I was a little, uh, I was a little astute here, too, because now you're showing the time a line on the albums that followed and I'm looking at I'm looking at the presentation and I'm like wait a minute the white album yeah yeah the white album doesn't matter I saw that before you even said it now nobody Mike 
has said this prior to you before. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was I didn't want people to um, to accuse me of just uh, going after the biological poll period, right? So they were like, oh, he just he just loves Billy, so he's going to you know deep six, no pun intended, <laughs> biological poll. And so I said, you know, so I'm going to take a look at one of the later albums, and I didn't want to choose Pepper because. I already knew that Sergeant Pepper was uh, was Billy's baby, and it was tightly controlled by Billy and George Martin. So I said, "Let me let me move to something after that." So I, let's take a look at the White Album. And I had known that you know the story was that the White Album, the songs of the White Album, most of them were written while they were in India mm -hmm. with the Maharishi that retreat. And even Wikipedia says the songs were written. Uh, most of the songs are written in the March April time frame. Over thirty. Over thirty. And one site said that they wrote 48. Okay. Now, the thing was, this all sounds like it, it's actually doesn't even sound possible, but let's just say that you think it's possible. What they don't tell you in the story is that the Beatles' time in India was staggered, that Ringo was only there for two weeks because he had become ill. And Billy was there for, for, uh, they arrived in mid-February, all four Beatles, around mid-February. Ringo was gone by March 1st. I'm doing this by memory. Billy was gone by March 15th or the, or the very least the latter part of March. And George and John stayed eight weeks. They left mid-April. Now, while they were in India, we all know that they were doing meditation and there were other activities at the retreat. How is it possible that as a band that they wrote over 30 songs when one of the primary songwriters, Billy, a.k.a. Paul McCartney, was out of there in March, yeah. mid to late March, and then John was out of there after eight weeks. So you're going, to, you're going to tell us that they wrote 30 plus songs when we can't even say eight weeks because half the band wasn't even there for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. it's, it's another... It's another story that when you put it under the microscope and you scrutinize it, it doesn't hold together. The Beatles did not write 30 plus songs in India because they didn't have the time to do it. And then, you know, with the 50th anniversary release of the White Album, we get the Escher demos. And these are allegedly the demos that the Beatles did leading into the White Album recording sessions, which started on May 30th, 1968. And we are told that on a single day in May of 1968, prior to recording, they went to George Harrison's bungalow mm -hmm. and they laid down 27 songs in a single day, in a single day, the demos. And the day is unknown. This is the most remarkable thing. It's like the photo shoot for Rubber Soul. Yeah. I could not find a specific date for the show, photo shoot for Rubber Soul, which, why is that? It's, it's one of the most iconic photo albums of all time, and yet we have no exact date for it. Why is that? Well, I would posit it's because if we give you a date, you're going to start looking at the timeline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the Escher demos, right? We don't have a date. And one of the sites, uh, the Beatles Bible, clearly says that there is no date. And I thought to myself, okay, this is very, very strange. So again, one of the most iconic Beatle albums of all time, the White Album, there's a demo of songs of which I think it was 19 of the 27 songs recorded that day ended up on the White Album. Some ended up on Abbey Road, and some of them actually never got released. Some later on in, in, in their solo career, like Not Guilty. Um, how could we not have a date for that? Hmm. Nobody has a date for that? You know? And so, um, so I concluded that there were no 27 songs recorded in a single day. That the 27 songs, yes, there are demos. Of course, we have them. We have the recordings. But what they were was rehearsals over a period of time. Yeah. What that period of time is, I have no idea. It could be one month, two months, three months, four months, but it wasn't a single day. Jeez. It's not credible. So with the White Album, the 30 plus songs written in India, when they they had a staggered 
uh, stay there. That's not credible. The 27 songs in one day for the White Album, the Escher demos, that's not credible. So what happened? So I, again, I applied the template that they used for Rubber Soul, which said that the songs were, were written. They were in process, you know? And it's not to say they, they didn't record some of the songs during the White Album sessions. In other words, you know, Billy didn't record and write and all that stuff, or John wasn't on recordings or George wasn't on recordings. It doesn't mean that. It just means that by the time they got into the White Album sessions, beginning May 30th of 1968, it was already, the stage was already set. And it's possible that a lot of those songs were already recorded and that they overlaid the vocals. And there were other times when other songs perhaps where they did record and, and did the vocals. But I think with the White Album, what we have is, I think we have a mix of songs that were written by songwriters outside of the Beatles, plus songs that were actual compositions by, uh, well, of course, by Billy, because Billy's compositions, I mean, he's he's always been been there, but as a songwriter and as a composer. But uh, I believe we do have John and George actually uh, writing songs and recording on the White Album. I, I, that's that's what I, I concluded. But it's a mix. It's a mix of the Beatles and a mix of not the Beatles on the White Album as far as musically playing. Yeah. And, you know, one of the last things you have on the presentation, and again, what, 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 what could this mean? What does this mean? But, man, you know, you present all of this so beautifully, Mike. And, Mike, how many slides were involved in this? It was like 100 and – uh, 50 or something, 140. Just incredible. But one of the last things after this entire presentation is John Lennon saying the music is a myth. Yeah. Yeah. Rolling Stone magazine. What does that mean? Right. John said in Rolling Stone magazine um, that he kept talking about the Beatles myth. And, you know, back in 1971, I think the interview was in 71, you would read that. And a lot of people just glossed over it. You know, what, what does it mean? Today, we have a much better understanding of what that means. And again, you know, we have John telling us. J John, when I look at, of, of all the Beatles, John was probably the one that was actually spilling the beans the most. He was. And in that Rolling Stone magazine and also the, uh, the Playboy interview in 1980, was another one where he was just dropping bombs, you know? And in, in those interviews, uh, whether it was the Rolling Stone one or the Playboy one, I forgot, but he said they were craftsmen. craftsmen. Right, right. And he said that by the time the Beatles got to the U.S., they were already old hands, which meant they were already like seasoned and you know, veterans at doing what they did. And what they were, what they did, their task was, to take the songs that were written, not by them, we're talking about the first seven albums, was to learn them and then take it out on tour. They were the veneer. They were the front men for these songs. That's, that's what their craft was. See, John didn't say we were songwriters. Mm -hmm. John didn't say we were composers. John said we were craftsmen. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a very strange way to word what it is that you do. And because that's John's way of telling us. Also, craftsman is, is a, a term that we associate with Freemasonry. So a, a Freemason is a craftsman, the craft, you know? And so I think John was basically giving us two clues, who they were, what club they belonged to, and what it is that they were doing. Mike, I want to read something. I got a couple of things to read to you. One of them blows me away, man. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong about this. This was kind of like 1969 and the, uh, the uh, you know, Billy Shears, Billy Shepard conspiracy was really starting to take hold. Okay. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Life magazine 
went out to Paul McCartney's f- uh, farm in Scotland yeah. to try to find out if there was any meat to this. Correct so far? Yeah. Okay. Now, from what I gather, McCartney, Billy was first, you know, paparazzi, get away from me, blocking himself from the camera. But then I heard that I guess they took some shot, some shots of him that he wasn't too pleased and he wasn't too happy with. So in exchange for them not printing those photos, he agreed to do a interview with them, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I've got two excerpts from the interview, and one really blows me away. My my first question to you before I read this first one is do you believe like once the, the Beatles were under the thumb of Tavistock? Yeah. Were they under the thumb of Tavistock until the day the brand the, the until the day the band dissolved? Yeah. I believe what? they were. Yeah. What, yeah. What? I mean, what happened was, what happened was they were, um, you know, they are a Tavistock creation. And so um, they are a, a Tavistock project. So in the early days, it came under the uh, the guidance and the direction of George Martin. Okay. And then the, the baton was handed to Billy. Okay. Starting in 1967 with Sergeant Pepper. But th- what we have to understand is that they all work within, they all work for, I should say, on behalf of, of the pyramid of power, right? Of Tavistock's agenda, which is what I talked about, which was the human potential movement, the Aquarian conspiracy, which then made its way into the new age movement and so on. Right. It's, you know, this, uh, this enlightenment that they talk about. And so, yes. So the, the answer to your question, um, Vince is yes. They, they continue to work in the pyramid. Listen to this quote, Mike, and I, you, you, you know all these, <laughs> but I've read this and now yeah. know, knowing what I know from you, I'm like, this is really interesting. This is from that Life 1971 article. Here's what okay. he said. Here's what he said. You see, there was a partnership contract put together years ago to hold us together as a group for 10 years. Anything anybody wanted to do put out a record, anything, he had to get the other's permission. Because of what we were then, none of us ever looked at it when we signed it. We signed it in 67 and discovered it last year. It's talking about 71 now. We discovered this contract that bound us for 10 years. So it's, oh gosh, oh gal, oh golly, oh heck, you know, now, now, boys can tear it up, please. But the trouble is the other three have been advised not to tear it up. They've been advised that if they tear it up, there will be serious bad consequences for them. The point, though, to me was that it began to look like a three-to-one vote which is what in fact happened at a couple of business meetings. It was three to one. And then he goes into Alan Klein. But do you think he's, is he talking about a Tavistock contract that if they didn't live up to the contract, bad things were, because it's funny to me, he says, um, they had been advised not to tear it up. They've been advised that if they tear it up, there will be bad, serious consequences to them. He never said their lawyers advised them. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a very strange uh, quote uh, in that article. And, you know, it's, it's hard to really put a finger on what exactly he's talking about. Um, the only thing I could think of, Vince, you know, what I, I have read that, is that um, you know, they were all bound contractually to um, as a band and what it is they could say, uh, what they can do. I mean, they didn't have a lot of room. I mean, if you remember in my uh, presentation is a, is a clip uh, of George Harrison saying from the anthology uh, DVD that it, they, they didn't have a vote in anything. Right. Yeah, I got that quote. Remember, yeah, yes. remember that, right? Yes, yes, yes. And, and yep. so... I, I think that what Billy's alluding to there is that um, 
I think at that point, everybody, were, everybody was making decisions for us. That's what he said. Yes. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think what happened was as they pushed on, especially within, you know, into phase three, which was 67 through 70, there was a lot of, I think, terse moments between them. Um, um, they got along. It was like love hate type of thing, right? They they got along. When I talk about they. I mean, Billy got along with the other three. The other three got along with him. But there were times when they didn't get along, and you know, part of the reason for that is because Billy's work ethic. He, he's he was a perfectionist, or he still yeah. is, right? And and this is something that John even mentions in interviews that he would say Paul was a perfectionist, and he's referring to Billy, and that clashed with them, you know. And because uh, Billy wanted things to click along, and he wanted uh, he wanted everybody on a tight leash because he had to manage this thing. So I think what he's saying there is that uh, I think there was a lot of I, I think a lot of them, the other three perhaps, were starting to really, really tire of the rigor. Yeah, and you know they were may, maybe even talking about you know what this is just a, a farce. And they couldn't come out and say anything because if they did, there would have been severe repercussions for it. What they, what it would have been, I don't know. I, I believe it probably could have meant very significant legal issues, probably retraction of uh, financial gains, because all of this stuff would have been would have been um, predicated on them keeping to the terms and conditions of the contracts that they signed. Yeah. So if they started flapping their lips, um, it, it would have been a big problem. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. why when people say, how come they don't talk about it? Well, I, I think a big reason is because they could have lost everything. Yeah. Now, here's the best part to me, man. Keep in mind this 1971 Life article, the whole, the, the whole thing started off of the hoax and them trying to find out if there was any meat to this. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This right. is the last thing he says, which blows me away because it's like, okay, they're coming. I don't want to I don't want to have anything to do with them. Well, I don't like some of the pictures, you know, you don't publish those pictures. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the story. Okay. Yeah. This is the last thing he says. So I think you've got to live your own life. That sounds like one of those statements, but it is in fact, just very necessary to realize that and particularly necessary for me or else someone else is going to be living part of your life. Yeah. He goes, or else somebody else is going to be living part of your life for you. Yeah. What does that mean? Right. Bro. Like <laughs> that's what they went there for. He tells them when it's all over and it just, it just blew by them. Like, what the frick does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's if you're uh, not, li if Mike, if you're not living your life right now, Mike Williams, if you're not living the life of Mike Williams, then who is living the Mike Williams life? Right. An That's imposter right. it would have to be. Exactly. Exactly. That's why Vince in the beginning of the, the show, we said that he, he's been dropping clues since day one. If you really read these interviews closely, the things that he says, the things that John had said, George and, and Ringo, if you, if you listen to the interviews or you read them very closely, knowing what we know now, you can start to, to pick it apart. And you could, like, like you said, what does that mean? What are you talking about? You know? And particularly necessary for me or else someone else is going to be living part of your life for you. Right. <laughs> you know what I noticed too? And it's one of the reasons I wanted to watch help and we'll end it on this. This is a little note, but one of the reasons I wanted to watch help because that's biological Paul. Yeah. Was did he do everything with his left hand? And he did. Yeah, he did. Man, when you watch, like there are a lot of wing documentaries out there and stuff he does everything with his right hand. And like, you know, Mike, I'm, I'm going to be 60. And the things he's doing with his right hand, even at my age, would be very awkward for me to do with my left hand. 
Yeah. And and like I said, when you look at those, everything was lefty, lefty, lefty. It just seemed later on when he let that guard down, he just comes across as a natural right-handed guy. I know it's a little thing, but it's very noticeable. No, that's one of the that's one of the things that we pick up on. See, when I started the presentation, one of the first two charts or so, I said one example by itself might not mean anything. Right. But a stream of evidence can be very significant. And I intentionally phrased it that way because, yes, we can sit there and say, we can make excuses all day as to why he's going lefty, righty, whatever it may be. But then when you pick up on that and then you move to something else and then something else and something else, and then you start to see patterns forming. And you know, then you have to apply common sense and logic and say, okay, something is up here. This does not look right. And you know what? What they want us to do is they they want to distract us from from doing that, from focusing on those little details, those little nuanced things that we pick up on, and just kind of just kind of chalk them up as just I don't know, doesn't really mean anything. It's like the article you just read, and there's many articles like that, right? We can read it and say, oh, I don't think it really means anything. What's he talking about? Oh, I don't know. And then people just walk away from it. Yeah. yeah. You know, but they're telling you and. Um, yeah, so it's been one crazy ride. I, I could tell you that. Well, Mike, crazy. I can tell you this, man. This all started for me, and you probably know the exact date. I'll never forget it, man. It had to be back in ninety in in sixty seven or sixty eight. F. Lee Bailey, yeah, the, the famous lawyer, hosted a special in prime time TV all about this. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going full circle now, Mike, because here we are. What? 40, 50 years later, you blew F. Lee Bailey out of the water, Mike, with this uh, with this president. <laughs> Mike, this, this president, man, Mike, this was magnificent, man. Magnificent. Yeah, thank you, Vince. And I it's it's hard to do it justice, you know, without without seeing the slide. Yeah, yeah. You know, because to, to see the dates and everything else, it's kind of hard to picture. Let everybody head. know exactly where to go to see this. Because guys, and, and and I recommend do an hour a night, do exactly yeah. what I did. Do an hour a night, break this thing up. But where do they go, Mike? Just go to my hub website, Sage of Quay, S A G E O F Q U A Y, sageofquay.com. And then just page down a little bit. And um, actually, I actually added it to my, my website. So you can just go there and see it. Or you can just click the link to my Paul is Dead channel or my main YouTube channel, and you can actually watch it there as well. So. It's up on BitChute. I have a BitChute account, but all the links to all of those uh, social media platforms are all on my hub website, and you can just go there and click away. And you have a it. you have a Patreon too, right, Mike? I have a Patreon. Yeah, it's it's anemic, but yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you go to my uh, hub website, you'll see the link there for my Patreon page as well. Well, I know what I'm going to do because there's no way you're done because we know Billy's, <laughs> Billy's back is coming out in the summer. So here's what I'm going to do. And here's what everybody else is going to do because Mike Mike is the absolute best. Mike, I swear to God, you, 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 you're such a great presenter. You do all this without trying to sway anybody either way. No. You you present the fact, and that's why I get so pissed off at you when you give us little tidbits about getting hate mail and this yeah. and that. You are the most honest. Listen, here's the information. Do what you want with the information. That's what I love about you. But here's, here's what I know I'm going to do because we could have talked about Corona for three yeah. hours. Yeah. I would assume that's going to be heavily talked about now on the Sage of Quay, correct? Yeah, I, well, I, I'm actually putting little blurbs out, you know, uh, just showing updates. I'm trying to, on my main channel, short videos, you know, five to 10 minutes where I'm just trying to get people to kind of wake up and understand that what you're being shown on the mainstream media is not actually reality. So when they tell you that the hospitals are overflowing with victims, but if you just go down to your local hospital or urgent care or primary care, you're not going to see that. And I'm trying to get people to connect dots that way. Yeah. I don't know how successful I'm going to be, but yeah. I'm trying to do that. 
Can I get you to admit right here, right now on this show, can I get you to admit that the coronavirus is going to be like a holding holding place until Billy Billy's back comes out? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I haven't, I, I, I'm not, tr- I'm not looking to invest a lot of time in coronavirus. Um, because for me, I, I mean, I see it, for, I believe I see it for what it is. Okay. Yeah. And so, and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to disagree with me. I mean, I get this all the time. I see it all around me. So I don't know. Um, I will, when Billy's back comes out, the summer, it's going right? to be summer, summer? Yeah, summer of this year. I will take a look at, at the footnotes and read through the book and I will do a little something on that. I, I will, I will do something on that. But as far as major presentations on the Beatles, I'm not going to be doing any more major presentations because the way I look at it, Vince, is this has been step by step. The first thing was, let's talk about the memoirs of Billy Shears because of what's contained in the book. Let's talk about the fact that biological Paul McCartney was replaced by somebody. Then let's get into the occult aspects of the Beatles. They are immersed in the occult. That was like phase two. And I actually have my own three phases. And phase three was um, that the Beatles were not what we were told that, that they were at all, that they did not write all of their own music. And that's not to say that they did not write some of their music, but they did not write all of the music that they, we are told that they wrote. And so, you know, once I did this last presentation, like you said, four and a half hours, I thought to myself, well, where do I go from here? Really, where do I go from here? Some people still want me to talk about, you know, Paul is dead clues, but I, I responded back to them. I said, look, I'm, I'm past that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's beyond that now. Uh, we've gotten into the occult. That was the next step. We've gotten kind of past that now. I have lots of shows that talk about the occult aspects of it. So if you're interested in that, you can watch that. And now I've gotten to the point where I'm like, okay, the whole thing was so fabricated to the point where it's even beyond comprehension for just about everybody. The good news is, though, that I was waiting for a real storm to just come my way because, you know, so many people love the Beatles, worship the Beatles. It's worship. It is. It's idol worship. And I was one of those people. So when I put this last presentation out, I thought, okay, here it comes. You know, the the tidal wave of hate and all that stuff is going to come. And uh, it didn't. You know, I, I mean, of course, I did get people who were completely irate and beside themselves. And, you know, they resort to their 15 year old, you know, mentality and they're commenting. But, you know, whatever. It's fine. You just get blocked. But for the most part, uh, I would say, I'm not even going to say for the most part, it's been overwhelmingly positive, overwhelmingly. And um, I've been driven to do this, Vince. Um, There were many times along this journey where I questioned why I was doing this. I started to question, like, why am I doing this? You know, it, it seems like I don't have to do this. I have other things in my life that I could be doing that are a lot more interesting than this. I mean, as far as giving me fulfillment in life. But there was this little voice in my head that said, keep going, keep going, keep going. You are almost there. Carry the ball one more yard and you're over the goal line. And that's how this has kind of played out. Yeah. You know, and I had a lot of obstacles between last year to when I got this out. Um, A lot of things that transpired in my own personal life as far as uh, things that had to do with health and family members and everything else that I had to deal with, it was grueling. And, but finally it's out and, uh, and people can watch it and decide for themselves. If you don't agree, you don't agree. Well, you know, again, Mike, you say this all the time and you've said this with every presentation you've ever done. You, you just provide the facts. And I think that's why you're not getting a a, a negative backlash. I mean, you you can't argue with these dates. These are real dates. These are real times. They're documented. You can't argue with them. I had somebody write me from within the music industry who watched the presentation and they said, you realize that nobody's going to be able to present the the official narrative going forward 
without having to, in some fashion, address what you've put out. Mm-hmm. Um, they can, I guess they can choose to ignore it. You know, that's an option, but they always run the risk that there's going to be somebody that has seen the presentation and is going to say, but what about the dates? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about the 16 songs in 30 days? What about the 30 plus songs in India? The 27 songs on some unknown day in May for the White Album. Mm-hmm. How about the Mercy Beat article? What's what's that about? Do we just gloss over that? Mm-hmm. Was that also like somebody writing something that, you know, that they wrote the wrong thing down and it got published? Mm-hmm. You know, it, it gets to a point where you you can't, continue to dodge the bullet on this thing. You know, when I, the article about them being in a haze of marijuana during the filming of help, that not only affected the filming of help, but that also affected any storyline that had to do with writing music during that period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so these are all things that now going forward, this is what this person told me. They said, it's, it's going to have to be dealt with. Um, So, you know, I, and I felt good about that. And, uh, but I didn't do this to, to throw a monkey wrench into anything. I really didn't. I I just did it because I found it interesting to, to look at this and then think to myself, how come nobody else ever counted up the days? Yeah. 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 You know, and, and I look, and I'm guilty of it. I didn't. It's just, I happened to be watching that DVD, which by the way, is very well presented. Scott Fryman does a great job on the DVD, but it is the official narrative. That's a wonderful job on it. But I remember watching it and then a light bulb went off and I said, okay, hold on a second. The tires screeched. I'm like, uh, oh, this didn't happen. And yeah. that's, that's what set me on the path. Yeah. You know, well, Mike, you've, uh, I mean, to every fan of the Beatles and anybody who's been following this story for decades, man, it, it wouldn't have been the same without you. I, I mean, I am so happy I stumbled upon you. I'm so happy we got to become friends. I, I'm going to be the first one knocking on the door in the summer. Yeah, yeah. The first one, Mike. <laughs> tell me about this. What is this? What I, the, the, the thing I love too, like especially when you get into the books, is man, all the information's in the footnotes. Yeah. And you have a way of really just dissecting those data. First of all, I'm too old. I can't even read the print. It's so small. <laughs> yeah, well, but Vince, I got readers too. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but Mike, man, I can't thank you enough. Um, man, I hope to have you on here. We could discuss any other topic. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I, I, I love you as a podcaster. Um, I love you as an information provider, man. And I just want you to know, I personally Man, thank you for this incredible, incredible work that you've done. Thank you, Vince. Thank you for having me on the show. This is the agreement we had too, folks. I told Vince he'd be the very first one to to talk to me about the presentation. That was way back, I think, October of, of last year. Yeah, and That's you how didn't long forget. I- you didn't forget. I did not forget. I keep yeah. to my commitments. Yeah. Well, everybody, it's sageofquay.com. You can go there and that will lead you to all the places that you need to be. Uh, Mike Williams, thank you for allowing me to experience this through your eyes. It's been an amazing, amazing trip. Thank you, Vince. All right. I will see everybody next time.